So in your lab packet, there is a diagram that shows you the scientific method. This is sort of a traditional depiction. Have you guys seen something like this before when you took high school biology? Yeah, so this kind of linear, simple, step one, step two um, is pretty common. So in the ex uh, experiment that we just described, what was the initial observation that started this whole thing? Hmm? The maggots on the meat. Perfect. And so what was Reddy's hypothesis? So his hypothesis was that the maggots were not spontaneously generated, but they were created from some other living organism that landed on the meat. Okay, and so we talked about what his experiment was, what his control was. And so his results were that his supported his hypothesis, right? Um, so if the case had been that his results did not support his hypothesis, the next logical step would be to go back and revisit your hypothesis and try to revise it to better understand what was going on and do another experiment. So this is a really nice, linear, clean, pretty way to talk about science. But this isn't actually how anybody does science. Scientists aren't perfect. Perfect Things rarely work out so neatly. Um, so this kind of description of how things work is a little bit misleading. I prefer to think about it in this way, which is that at the center of all scientific inquiry is a question. It's the most important part. It's to start with a solid question. And from there, you can make observations and define your problem, form a hypothesis, do some background research. A lot of times when people get to this stage of background research, they realize someone has already done what they're thinking about doing, or they learn some new information they were previously unaware of, and they go back and adjust their hypothesis, or they redefine their problem. They go on to design an experiment. Sometimes it doesn't work. You need to do more research. So it really is sort of a cyclical process where you revisit previous steps as needed. So if you are doing something and it doesn't work out exactly like that linear description of the scientific method, don't worry about it. You can revisit what you've already done. You can adjust things. People do this all the time. I don't really know of anyone who does science in such a perfect, clean, neat way. So don't be discouraged if you kind of have to circle back sometimes. It's OK. All right, so today what we're going to do is do our own experiment using the scientific method. Um, and so the question, the central question for today is, how does ethanol influence the physiology, specifically the heart rate of a living organism? So what is ethanol? You may know? Yeah. It's a form of alcohol. It is a form of alcohol. And where do you most commonly encounter alcohol? I don't want to know who's 21. That's not, it's irrelevant for today. And what substances do you encounter alcohol? This type of ethanol. Hairspray. What about something you eat, something you ingest? Yeah, so what kind, of, what kind of substances have ethanol in them? Gasoline, Gasoline maybe. What What'd you say? Yes. Beer. beer. Very good. All right, so beer, wine, <laughs> scotch, bourbon. I know you guys knew the answer to that. You just didn't want to say it. So yeah, so ethanol is a drinkable type of alcohol. So in order to test the effects of ethanol, on a living organism, we have to have a living organism. So today, the model organism that we are going to use is a daphnia. Has anybody ever seen one of these before? Yeah? So a daphnia is also called a water flea, um, and it's a crustacean. Does anyone know another kind of animal that's a crustacean? Yeah. A crab. Yeah, a crab or a lobster. So it's just a tiny, tiny little invertebrate. Doesn't, doesn't have a backbone. Crustacean. Um, and what do you notice about its body? It's transparent. It's clear. So if we're interested in studying the heart rate and we want to use a model organism, this is really perfectly suited to our needs because since its outer, the outer part of its body is clear, this is the heart, we can actually view the heart beating. Let's think about what exactly we think will happen. So when you observe a drunk person, what happens to them? What kind of effects 
do you think that alcohol has on a person? Slurred speech, very good. What else? Blurred vision, very good. What else? Loss of memory, perfect. How about um, motor control? Are drunk people typically very coordinated? No. no. So this gets back to our question of what is it depressing? So all of these things, your speech, your vision, your memory, your ability to control your muscles, those are all sort of uh, coordinated by your central nervous system. So what it's doing is it's acting on your central nervous system to affect those pieces. So if I told you that the heartbeat, the heart rate of a daphnia is controlled by neurons, it's controlled by the central nervous system, what do you think will happen if we give it alcohol, which depresses the central nervous system to the heart? Do you think it will speed up or slow down? You just said that because he said that. No, you're right, you're right. That makes sense. That's, that's a logical conclusion from this background information that we have. But we can't be sure unless we test it, right? Yeah, that it's moving so, around, looks alive. Like no. So some of them, they, they have exoskeletons that shed, so you don't want to grab that. So then right there, right over the light, should be, should be about where you want it. I mean, you would really kind of want to ride it after the, um, I guess You guys doing okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you find the heart? On the blood like uh, you can see the other side of, on the other side of it. Like a little bit, but you So the pointer right now is pointed at the heart. Let's take a look at that. If in order to be really confident that this value is actually representative of what Daphne's heart rate does in 4% ethanol. I would want to do this again with more groups. So, but the data is what it is, so it, it went up. So that would account for if the um, water on the slide, increased water on the slide, would account for a higher value than you would expect, but it still shouldn't be higher than the control. Um, but so maybe it's an interaction of all those factors. So this result didn't support our hypothesis, so maybe in the future, if we wanted to really be confident, we would have to revisit it. But what about 6%? 6% worked. worked. So this is a great example of what I was talking about earlier, which is that science is not always pretty and it's not always perfect. You don't always get what you expect or what you want. So what I want you to do is to make a graph using these class averages. We're going to make a bar graph. Um, so on page 11, you guys have some graph paper. I want you to set up this y-axis going up by units of 10. And then on the bottom, I want you to have a space for 0% ethanol, which is our control, good. Control, then a space for 4% and a space for 6%. Um, and you need to label your axes. So, so try to make yours more accurate when you do it. This is just sort of an example. Um, they don't need to be beautiful. They don't need to be colored in. Just make sure they're correct. Um, and then you also need to write a title for your graph, something that's descriptive of what it is that you're looking at. Um, and make sure you have your axis labels. Then use your the class average data. Only use those three average numbers um, to do these calculations and answer these couple questions on these two pages. And then after that, you guys can head home. All right, and let me know if you have questions, if you need help.